conversation across the United States during the recent weeks. This includes seeing stormwater and the specific research showing up in national and regional news headlines. As you see, media coverage from Wired to the Houston Chronicle to the Los Angeles Times has highlighted the vast potential to factor stormwater into the broader water resilience picture. Moving forward from these headlines, we invite you to learn more about the numbers, the context, and the recommendations during today's webinar. If you haven't already, you can download the report at the link being shared in the chat. This work focused on the stormwater approach is part of a larger portfolio of research and outreach on water efficiency and reuse strategies conducted at the Pacific Institute. Pacific Institute, as you'll see on the next slide, is an independent, nonpartisan global water think tank. We are based in the United States and have staff all around the world. The Pacific Institute conducted some of the earliest groundbreaking research linking climate change and water systems through our ambitious organizational goal we aim to catalyze a transformation to water resilience in the face of climate change by 2030. For more information on the left of your screen, you'll see the issue brief published by the Pacific Institute on the topic of water resilience. What is it and how can you play a role to help build it? We invite you to download a copy of the water resilience issue brief with the link located in chat. As a nonprofit organization, the Pacific Institute does rely on funding from donors, grants, and other sources. If you're interested in supporting our work moving ahead, please follow the link being shared in the chat now. Moving to the next slide, it's my honor to introduce you to today's panelists. From the Pacific Institute, Dr. Brooke Burhanu is a senior researcher and lead author of this report. Heather Cooley is director of research at the Pacific Institute. And Shannon Spurlock is a senior researcher focusing on policy and practice uptake. This work is conducted in partnership with Second Nature. And from Second Nature, we welcome today Dr. Nicole Beck. This work was also conducted in collaboration with a strong advisory committee. From that committee, we welcome Nathan Campo. As you'll see on the next slide, we offer thanks to the entire project team in addition to those on today's webinar including Morgan Shimabuku, Jessica Derry, Tiffany Curry, Sambul Mashudi, and many other staff for making this research and its launch possible. We also thank the Second Nature team, including Dr. Catherine Riyamaki, Gary Conley, and Tyler Nodine. We offer thanks to the entire project advisory team, as well as the BHP Foundation and other funders of the Pacific Institute for generously supporting this work. As you'll see on the next slide, today's webinar agenda, we will start with Heather Cooley setting the stage and providing context. Next, Dr. Nicole Beck from Second Nature will discuss the spatially distributed modeling approach that was used to conduct the analysis. Next, Dr. Brooke Burhanu from the Pacific Institute will outline the key findings that are indeed making news headlines. Then he and advisory board member Nathan Campo will share some case examples on how stormwater approaches are being implemented in specific regions of the United States. Next, Shannon Spurlock will provide an overview of key recommendations for policy and practice made in the report. And around the bottom of the hour, we'll turn to a robust audience Q&A session. So please have your questions ready. Before we get started, a few announcements. This session is being recorded. And as a participant, your mic is being muted. Please do use the Q&A function to submit questions to the panelists for that Q&A session that will begin around the bottom of the hour. The slides and recording will be made available at the conclusion of the webinar. And if you're a journalist, we welcome you today. Please share your questions or requests for data or interviews with us at media at hackinst.org. And if you have any technical questions, please post those in the Q&A function. As you'll see on the next slide, we're going to uh, have a poll to understand how our audience is approaching stormwater at this time. We'll pause for that poll. We'll share the results later in the webinar. So right now, if we could bring the poll up, we wanted to ask, do you see stormwater as a nuisance to be managed, a potential water supply resource, but too difficult or costly to implement, a water supply resource, and that you're actively taking steps to capture more of it, a multi-benefit resource, 
and you're actively taking steps to capture more of it, all of the above or none of the above, we welcome you to take part in the poll now and we'll pause for just a moment to give you a chance to do that. We see the numbers coming in rapidly and we will uh, welcome you to continue to enter your answers and we'll be discussing the results with our panelists later on in the webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our first panelist, my colleague, Heather Cooley, Director of Research at the Pacific Institute. Heather, over to you. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, next slide, please. Before we discuss our approach and key findings, let me first start by defining urban stormwater runoff. Urban stormwater runoff is generated from precipitation falling on rooftops, roads, and other hard surfaces in urbanized areas. Stormwater runoff carries pollutants like oils, pesticides, and heavy metals to nearby waterways and threatens aquatic life and public health. Stormwater can also lead to flooding in low-lying areas. As a result, stormwater has been viewed as a nuisance and our urban areas were designed to collect and dispose of it as quickly as possible. But as you'll see on the next slide, perspectives on stormwater are changing. Um, increasingly, it, stormwater is being used as a resource. Around the world, cities as diverse as Shanghai, Berlin, and Philadelphia are replacing concrete with green spaces and other permeable surfaces. These sponge cities help absorb stormwater, making them more flood and drought resilient. As another indication of this shift, uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency explicitly referenced stormwater in its water reuse action plan. This plan calls for elevating stormwater capture at a local, state, and regional level. As you'll see in the next slide, approaches for capturing stormwater are varied. They can include green or gray infrastructure or a combination of the two, and they can encompass distributed and centralized approaches. A more distributed approach, uh, as shown on the left, includes disconnecting downspouts at a residence and diverting that water into a rain garden. This reduces runoff and helps to conserve drinking water. As shown on the right, stormwater capture can also include large centralized projects like the Tahunga Spreading Grounds in Los Angeles. There are a series of bowls the size of football fields store stormwater and recharge groundwater aquifers uh, that are used for drinking water. As you'll see in the next slide, the drivers and co-benefits of stormwater capture are also varied. In some areas, water quality and flood protection are the major drivers, uh, but in others, augmenting and diversifying water supplies may be the major drivers. But even beyond these water benefits, stormwater capture projects can also pro provide additional co-benefits. This is especially true for green infrastructure. Green spaces can provide habitat for plants and wildlife, they can help to cool the urban environment, reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and they can provide recreational space for communities. Despite growing interest in stormwater capture and recognition of its multiple benefits, there's limited data and information about how much stormwater is available. This assessment seeks to fill that gap. As you'll see on the next slide, we estimate that the average annual stormwater runoff potential in the United States is 59.5 million acre feet. To put these numbers in perspective, this represents about 93% of municipal and industrial water use. We find opportunities for stormwater capture across the United States. Uh, coastal areas in particular offer an outsized opportunity these areas account for just 12% of urban land area, but an overwhelming 37% of urban storm of the national urban storm stormwater runoff potential. We conclude that stormwater capture presents a significant yet unrealized opportunity for enhancing urban water resilience in communities across the United States. 
And now I'll hand it over to our partner, Nicole Beck from Second Nature. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, happy to be here. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Second Nature, we're a science-based technology firm. We're out of Santa Cruz, California. We're a team of scientists like myself, GIS experts, and software developers. Um, we take pride in our contributions to defensible open science to uh, help advance the stormwater industry. And then we embed our peer-reviewed science into software products to make it accessible and actionable for local decision makers. Um, you can think of us as a stormwater uh, accounting system and the tools um, that we use to inform stormwater policy, like this great work with the Pacific Institute. Um, we support local, state and local agencies to do complete, um, comply with their MS4 permit requirements that come down from the Clean Water Act in the United States. Um, the data and the tools can be used for watershed and city regional planning, and uh, we're increasing our interactions with corporations who are incorporating rainwater management strategies in their water stewardship programs. Um, ultimately, all of it is um, we're interested in quantifying and tracking the environmental return on those investments. Um, this map that I provide is an example of some of the visualizations. You can see how a local group, this is a amount of runoff, so dark areas, more runoff. Um, and you can see how this could be used to think about where to implement the right solutions um, to control stormwater. And then the inset is a summary of how the data can be aggregated. So um, looking at current runoff and the amount across that entire city, comparing it to consumptive demand, um, and then putting in you know, precipitation uh, projections from climate models and starting to understand more about how we see uh, stormwater patterns changing as a result of climate change. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the method behind that Billings example and the research um, here that we're talking about today uh, is what we refer to as Teller, the tool to estimate load reductions. Um, I came into the field of um, watershed modeling and, and the public sector, and the methods and the framework seem to have evolved from uh, and engineering and hydraulic modeling, where continuous precipitation inputs are critical to size pipes and bridges, but maybe not as well suited um, or maybe overly computationally intensive for the purpose of trying to prioritize where to make, you know, put stormwater controls and then quantify the hydrologic and water quality benefits of those investments. And similarly, existing models didn't quite preserve the spatial variability of the landscape, which we know is critical when we start thinking about how we're going to manage or capture, or use that stormwater appropriately. So um, we flip that on its head. We like to say teller trades time for space. Um, so on the left, you'll see uh, the summary of a probabilistic approach for to the precipitation input. So we pre-process um, daily precipitation records into six input variables, and then just use a common mathematical method. Um, and we can do that for a season, for a specific year, for a time interval that we have monitoring data. So then we can do a validation and calibration of the data or long decadal time steps. Um, and then on the right side, we make use and preserve the 30 meter grid um, of the earth that many common land use and land cover and different types of satellite data sources um, are made available. Um, and so we're quantifying the amount of runoff and then the pollutant loading at that 30 meter grid, which is about two tenths of an acre resolution. Uh, we first published some of the Teller work in 2017, um, and to date, Teller's been the lead or supporting role in six different publications. Um, and it's really flexible, and we keep finding different new ways to, to put it to work. So like this work with the Pacific Institute, if you go to the next slide, um, the question that we wanted to ask was, what is the stormwater runoff potential of the U.S. developed areas? So taking that methodology across the United States, um, we the precipitation inputs are 30 year time series from uh, 1981 to 2019. And then we used a land use land cover data set from 2019 um, and then summarize those results to all of the urban areas in the United States, which is slightly over 2,600. And then from there, summarize the distribution across the states for those uh, urban areas, as well as 
um, looking at watersheds and these USGS Huck 8 totals. Um, and also added a link here if you want to learn more. We've um, put out a, we maintain a, a story map that uh, gives more detail on California's stormwater opportunity. So have a look if you have a chance. And I'm going to hand it to Brooke here, who's going to share the results. Great. Thank you, Nicole, for that uh, great, great overview. Um, so yes, my name is Brooke Berhano, and now I'm going to speak about some of the most significant findings from this work. Um, we weren't certainly not able to cover all of them in this webinar, and so I also highly recommend that you uh, check out the report um, afterwards for, for more detail. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we are starting with the national perspective uh, from this work, and so using um, the approach that uh, Nicole just uh, outlined for us, for the roughly 2,700 or so urban areas across the country, uh, we estimate a top line uh, national annual average runoff potential of 59.5 million acre feet per year, or about 53 billion gallons per day, um, if that unit of measure is um, uh, more applicable to your, to your field. Um, and that, that's a huge number. Uh, another way to look at it would be uh, that this volume would be enough to cover about 45 million uh, football fields in uh, a foot depth of water. Um, and maybe another more relevant way to look at it is in terms of water use. Um, so this estimate represents about 93% of the total municipal and industrial water use for the United States, um, estimated in 2015, uh, based on uh, publications from the, the uh, USGS. And uh, so, so yes, that is a lot of water uh, being generated, uh, even higher than, than previous amounts from other researchers, uh, as well as from, from the EPA. But it's important to remember that this number represents the total identified runoff potential. Uh, and in practice, uh, it won't be feasible or even desirable to capture 100% of this uh, stormwater runoff. Um, some of it needs to remain within the environment to support ecosystem health and protect habitats. Uh, and some of it becomes part of uh, surface water supplies for uh, other downstream communities that are already being used. Uh, but still, this view of the results can really help us uh, better understand just how large the opportunity for stormwater capture actually is. And, and we'll talk about some of these opportunities uh, over the next few slides. Uh, so um, the next finding that we wanted to highlight is zooming in a little bit and looking uh, just at um, coastal areas across the U.S. or areas that border uh, either of the oceans, the Atlantic or Pacific, um, or the Great Lakes. Um, so this map on the right here shows um, hydrologic basins uh, that, that border um, each of those major, major water bodies I just uh, mentioned, and, and they're color-coded based on the amount of annual total runoff with blue colors uh, signifying higher runoff and red colors signifying uh, lower runoff. And we look, we wanted to look at coastal areas in particular uh, because they typically aren't constrained by the same requirements for uh, downstream water users um, as their uh, more inland counterparts. Uh, and that's because the stormwater generated in these areas uh, are, are, aren't, uh, aren't used by uh, other human users before they end up flowing into the oceans of the Great Lakes. Um, and at the same time, they can also convey additional pollutants that are picked up from urban surfaces uh, into those coastal ecosystems. Uh, so coastal areas present an opportunity to look at uh, regions that could have an easier time implementing stormwater capture from, from that perspective. Uh, and when we look at these areas, as, as Heather mentioned earlier, uh, we found that over a third of the national stormwater runoff uh, potential is generated in just these uh, uh, coastal uh, areas. Um, and that is a, an outsized impact in terms of the amount of stormwater being generated uh, when you consider that um, the urban areas within these coastal regions make up just about 12% of the total urban land area across the country. Um, now, of course, any implementation of stormwater capture in these areas still needs to account for and, and avoid any detrimental impacts to ecosystems um, that rely on the stormwater to function properly. Uh, but in some cases, stormwater capture can actually be used to help offset some of these um, um, uh, environmental uh, concerns related to, to, eco uh, to, eco to coastal ecosystems. So uh, in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of what these results means for well, what these results mean for individual urban areas across the country. So this map shows um, the, the top 20 out of the 2,700 or so uh, U.S. urban areas uh, in terms of volumetric potential, uh, with a number uh, next to each city um, corresponding to the overall rank with 
New York City being uh, ranked number one, the most uh, runoff and um, Austin, Texas being ranked number 20 out of the top 20 um, with, the, with the lowest runoff within that group. And then the bar chart on the right just gives you a, a bit of a visual representation of, of how much that uh, stormwater generation varies across each of these cities. So as you can see, um, there's a there's a huge potential uh, for for storm uh, or th there's a huge potential for stormwater runoff even in the uh, more kind of drier and more arid regions of climates with less annual precipitation uh, as evidenced by uh, Los Angeles there um, uh, over uh, at, at um, number 18 over on the west coast. Um, so yeah, Los Angeles, which ranks 18th out of the almost 2,700 urban areas, um, receives less than 15 inches of precipitation per year on average. Um, but, we're, but what we're seeing is that the, large, the high amount of urban land area in Los Angeles can help offset that relatively low precipitation and still produce a meaningful amount of stormwater runoff um, that can then be captured. Uh, but we also want to caution that, you know, even if an urban area isn't within the top 20 or even the top 50 or even the top 100 urban areas in terms of volumetric potential, um, they could still have very strong cases uh, to implement stormwater uh, capture. And that decision will depend on the local needs and drivers and barriers of, of the community considering it. Um, and, and especially in areas with low uh, runoff potential, uh, stormwater capture can still create meaningful water supply benefits, um, especially in water constrained communities. And of course, uh, as, we met, as we discussed previously, there are other co-benefits uh, that could provide additional drivers for implementation. Uh, next slide, please. So to put these num so to put these numbers into a bit more uh, context, um, the results of our analysis clearly show that there's a vast opportunity to support water resilience in communities by implementing more stormwater capture uh, to supplement water supplies and help offset the negative impacts of urban stormwater runoff. Uh, and we need to elevate the role of stormwater capture across the country as part of the toolbox to help alleviate the increasing stress on our water supplies. So the next steps would be for communities to build on these results. Uh, and to determine how much stormwater capture is feasible for them. And that involves looking at local context and considering factors such as potential impacts on downstream water users, including in, uh, the environment, um, local stormwater management requirements, allowable uses for stormwater, um, the specific method of capture that would be the most appropriate and its associated costs, uh, and the potential to uh, realize other co-benefits. Um, so now along with uh, one of our advisory group, uh, Nathan, um, I, uh, he and I will talk about a couple of case examples that we developed for the report, um, uh, looking uh, in this case at a more water strained um, um, state in, uh, in the case of Arizona, and as also a more kind of uh, traditionally water abundant state in Minnesota. Uh, so uh, Nathan, take it away, please. Thank, thank you, Brick. Um... My name is Nathan Campo. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a water resources engineer uh, and principal in, in uh, BARS Denver office. And I, um, in, in addition to being fortunate to be on the advisory uh, committee for this really important project, I um, uh, am a practitioner, a designer, implementer, and and I also help uh, my clients operate and maintain stormwater reuse systems, uh, primarily in Minnesota. So to provide the Minnesota context, uh, Minnesota is a, a more abundant or a more water abundant state than than many, um, uh, not not as much as most, uh, or as some. So kind of in the middle, the Twin Cities metropolitan area gets about 32 inches of precipitation annually. Although there's a pretty wide range across the state, the state from about 25 inches in the northwest to about 36 inches annually in the in the southeast. Um, groundwater is a really important part of uh, our drinking water our drinking water supply. 75 percent. Of Minnesotans get their drinking water from groundwater, even though we have such a, a rich abun abundance of of surface water with our with our lakes and our rivers. So, in terms of uh, drivers for uh, stormwater reuse, re groundwater sustainability is really important, and that that derives from the fact that we we use a lot of of our um, uh, groundwater supplies uh, for drinking water and for irrigation. Um, water quality protection is also extremely important. Uh, we, you know, in Minnesota, we really value our, our lakes and our rivers and the, and the water quality, and we have a really strong regulatory regime around protecting those, um, which has led to uh, a pretty stringent uh, permitting requirements. So in, in cases where, where um, redevelopment is not able to meet um, the really strict volume control requirements that, that we have in the state, 
uh, other volume control, you know, through infiltration um, or more traditional practices to achieve stormwater volume control, we have to move to um, uh, things like stormwater reuse, and that's a really um, important component. For on the industrial side, uh, there are some unique situations where where permits do not allow any discharge from a facility, which provides opportunities then for stormwater capture and reuse to to meet multiple objectives of sustainability and meeting zero discharge requirements. And finally, a lot of organizations are mission driven, have uh, uh, in terms of sustainability, they want to do the right thing, and and that leads to a lot of really innovative, um, uh, often demonstration type projects uh, for stormwater capture and reuse. So what does that look like? Well, in, in Minnesota, that that's often and usually um, irrigation. It could be irrigation at a large scale through purple pipe networks for for golf courses and parks. It could be at the development scale, like this the the project that I have in the background here, um, where eight acres of redevelopment um, it was captured. The runoff from that was captured and reused for about two acres of green space, parks, and community gardens. Um, inside the building, uh, stormwater or rainwater from rooftops can be brought back into flush toilets. Um, uh, on the industrial side, it could be uh, putting stormwater into cooling processes. Um, uh, and an exciting opportunity that's discussed more in the, in the report, and I encourage you to read that, is the implementation of managed aquifer recharge, actually taking our stormwater, putting it back into the ground to really directly address uh, some of the declining groundwater um, supplies that we have. Uh, and uh, Brooke, I'll pass it back over to you. Great, thank you, Nathan, for for uh, yeah, for that deep dive in, into the Minnesota context. Um, so yeah, uh, Nathan uh, mentioned the strategy of managed aquifer recharge, and uh, the next case example that we'll talk about is one for um, Arizona, which has a long history of uh, implementing uh, managed aquifer recharge. Um, in contrast to the relatively water rich Minnesota, um, Arizona is a state that um, you know uh, experiences near constant water scarcity stresses. Uh, the state of Arizona has implemented their water banking program in the 1980s to make uh, use of excess water in certain years to help recharge their depleting groundwater aquifers through several storage facilities located across the state, uh, shown as the dots um, in the map. Um, and currently, the state primarily uses excess surface water from the Central Arizona project when available, as well as recycled water uh, from wastewater treatment plants for these recharge efforts. And so the thinking here is that um, as the infrastructure for uh, managed aquifer recharge is already in place throughout this state, um, adding stormwater to the mix as available as an available water supply um, can really help boost the efforts to uh, replenish gra the uh, diminishing groundwater. And the potential benefits are huge. Uh, looking just at the Phoenix metro area as an example, we found that enough storm urban stormwater runoff is generated uh, in the Phoenix metro annually uh, to fill the annual average water supply gap that's been estimated over the next 100 years by the Arizona State Department of Water Resources. Um, even, if even a third of this volume could be captured feasibly, it would meet nearly all, all, each, uh, all of the projected uh, annual shortfalls uh, of, water, of water supply of 49,000 acre feet per year um, um, estimated by the Arizona uh, Department of Water Resources. Um, this is, of course, speaking on an average on an annual average basis, with uh, accounting for you know fluctuations in uh, water availability from year to year. Uh, next slide, please. So we've just covered a couple of examples of what stormwater capture could look like uh, in existing areas, and we discussed these uh, examples in more detail in the report, uh, as well as a couple of other examples that are uh, more uh, focused on a formal water supply planning perspective. One in for the state of Texas, and then one for regional collaboration in uh, uh, northern Georgia. Uh, so we highly recommend you check out the report for more information uh, on these case examples. And I'll now turn it over to Shannon Spurlock to uh, speak a bit about how we then took these findings and were able to develop recommendations for policy and practice. Great. Thank you so much, Brooke. And let's move on to, oh, uh, next slide for guidelines. So hello, everyone. I will be highlighting a few of the recommendations from the national assessment. The really, the big picture here is that changes will need to occur to remove opportunity, to remove barriers and advance opportunities to advance stormwater capture. While the report covers over 25 recommendations, I will be highlighting a few representative recommendations from this report. The recommendations fall within four key buckets, regulatory guidance, funding and financing, governance and research. 
with a theme of maximizing multiple benefits cross-cutting across all thematic areas. With regulatory guidance, we recognize the opportunity to elevate stormwater capture on the national water planning agenda. This can be achieved in a number of ways, including the establishment of comprehensive national guidelines by federal entities to foster consistency and clarity in stormwater capture projects. In our next slide, we'll delve deeper into federal, into funding and financing. Through our existing funding models, including the state revolving program, state revolving funds program, there are limited opportunities for stormwater capture to be advanced or even competitive with other strategies. Thus, to begin to level that playing field, one of the recommendations is that states should strongly consider establishing funding programs to support stormwater capture. These programs can integrate water and non-water benefits into their decision-making process so that funded, funded projects are able to provide multiple benefits to the communities in which they are located. In our next slide, we're focusing on governance. And there are key ways in which stormwater capture can be fostered and advanced. Privately owned land represents significant volumetric potential for stormwater capture. At the federal or state level, establishing guidance on how to best engage and include private landowners through stormwater credit trading programs and alternative compliance options for municipal and industrial stormwater permits are but a couple of ways to advance public-private partnerships. And then finally, we're gonna close out this recommendations section with a focus on research. And Brooke mentioned this earlier, but there are some key research gaps that are constraining the adoption of stormwater capture as a water supply strategy. Supportive research can include the advancing of, the, of uh, incorporating climate change impacts on precipitation using existing projections, delving in deeper into regional and local constraints, and the inclusion of existing stormwater projects and the current volumes that are currently being captured. So with that, we'll move on from recommendations and I'll hand it back to our moderator, Amanda. Thanks so much, Shannon. And thanks to all of our panelists today. Next, we'll head into what will likely be a robust Q&A session. So please do make sure to add your questions in the Q&A function. We have uh, staff uh, standing by to funnel your questions to the panelists. Before we kick off the questions, we'd like to return to the results of the poll, which I hope you see on your screen. We'd like to uh, notice uh, in the poll that about 15% of you on the call today are still see seeing stormwater runoff as a nuisance to be managed and removed. However, the largest response, about a third of respondents, uh, almost a third say they view stormwater as a multi-benefit resource and they're actively taking steps to capture more of it. I think in response to the poll, we might uh, throw it open to our panel and just ask uh, the whole panel, what may surprise you or not surprise you uh, about the results from our poll today? Uh, well, Would I anyone? Can, oh, go ahead, Brooke, please. <laughs> I can certainly yeah, uh, try to try to start off the conversation. Um, I, I, I think the the you know the fifteen percent um, really related to the perspective of stormwater as a nuisance just really speaks to um, the, how how we've historically viewed stormwater, uh, uh, at least urban stormwater, uh, in many cases, and really um, you know the, the the paradigm shift from a nuisance to a resource is something that's that's still in progress and something that we hope to kind of push forward with this report as well as um, but there are also countless efforts going on across the country um, that I, or that 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 are that encapsulate this perspective and so um, you know being able to support support those efforts and implement new ones I, I, ideally would help uh, shift this perspective a bit more um, and I also I was interested to see kind of the different um, uh, perhaps uh, priorities, or or at least maybe the split between the views of stormwater more from a water supply perspective uh, versus um, more of the uh, active multi benefits perspective, um, and 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 those two juxtaposed. Uh, we probably should have included an option that 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 allowed for both of those to be considered at the same time, but 
um, uh, yeah, definitely interesting and interesting to see. Anyone else on the panel like to chime in? Well, I'm, I'm just really heartened to see, you know, there were a couple in here that suggest either a water supply resource that they're actively taking steps for or multi-benefit that they're actively taking steps or all of the above. And if you, you combine all of those, that's over, that's over half. Um, so I think that is, you know, um, heartening in it, to me in that there are many that are, are already transitioning. That was the, the shift in the perspective we touched on. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to do more. That's still the half that, that aren't. Um, but I think that's a really exciting finding as well. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Heather. I think we'll move on to our first uh, question from our audience members today. It's, it's one we've heard a lot so far in this research, and that refers to just because we know now that all of this stormwater exists and can be captured, should we capture all of this stormwater? What are some of the limitations, uh, including water rights, uh, that might be a caution around just because we can capture all of this, maybe we, sh we shouldn't capture 100% of this. So I'll, I'll toss that over to the panel as our first question. I can chime in with some thoughts to start off. And I'll say one thing I really appreciate about this assessment is that we talk about what it is and what it isn't. And one thing when we get this large, the, when we see the volumetric potential nationally, I think it's really exciting, but we also call out and we say, it's not feasible to capture all of the stormwater and nor should you. So I think there's a broad recognition from the get-go and yet we're laying the foundation for urban communities to recognize the potential to really see what, understand what they're already capturing and how close can they get to maximizing that local or regional potential to have a more reliable water supply. Thanks, and I, I, I can build on that too, Amanda, too. You know, one of the reasons that the, that all of that runoff uh, can't can't be uh, captured, there's several reasons, but there may be downstream communities that are dependent on that. There may be downstream ecosystems dependent on those flows. Um, there's infrastructure investments that would need to be made to, to capture it. So those are some of the constraints. Um, what we tried to do here is to really understand at a high level what that potential is. And then that allows for then more local and regional assessments to really start to integrate some of those local constraints to understand what that potential might be for their community. Um, you know, we want to really be clear, we don't see stormwater as, as the solution for all of our problems. However, it can contribute to helping reduce that supply demand gap, um, augment and diversify supplies, but also address some of the other many water quality, flood risk. Um, and opportunities with green infrastructure to support urban greening. So there's lots of co-benefits uh, and opportunities, again, we see in communities uh, across the country, and it allows for some of that more refined local and regional analysis um, to better understand what it might be. So thank you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, for this next question, we're going to turn it over to the practitioner perspective. So Nathan uh, Campo will bring you in this for, in for this one. Um, you're someone who's responsible for implementing these sorts of stormwater projects at the, the local and the regional level. Uh, we have quite a few folks who are curious about what some of the biggest barriers you're seeing uh, that are preventing maybe more stormwater capture projects from being implemented. So Nathan, over to you. Sure. So living in Denver, and so living in the West, but practicing in the Midwest where there's more water, I kind of have a couple of perspectives. You know, I think the biggest barrier here in the West is really um, what Shannon was, was touching on is there's um, regulatory and legal barriers uh, to using, you know, what might be perceived or what legally is somebody else's water. And so I think that is the biggest um, impediment uh, here, here in the West. There are certain ways to get around that in certain situations. And we've been able to do that in, 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 with, with, uh, uh, with the managed aquifer, aquifer recharge project in in Utah, where it, where we were able to find thread that needle of, of water of water rights and use use stormwater to recharge aquifers, and it's really exciting. In areas where you don't have that, um, a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the barriers are um, are around uh, regulatory uh, still, but in a in a different way. So, or it might be organ even organizational. So, who's going to 
manage it? Who's going to take care of it? Um, uh, you know, sort of this interagency. There's so many agencies that get involved with water in every community, uh, from the from the state down to the often many local entities overlapping jurisdictions. And so, kind of navigating all that on the regulatory side, but then on the on the on the operations and the maintenance side. It's easier to build it. It's a lot harder to harder to take, take care to take care of it in, in the long term. So, I see. Um, these projects take a lot of coordination down at the at the hyper local level, and it's that coordination um, that uh, is so important, but takes time. And sometimes that coordination doesn't move at this pace of a, of the project, and we miss opportunities. Nathan, thanks so much for that response. Nicole Beck from Second Nature will head over to you with this next question. It has to do with the, the modeling uh, being based on historic precipitation records. And the specific question is, you know, climate is, is rapidly changing, uh, creating uh, changes to the water cycle and when water is falling and, and how much of it is falling in local communities. So the question to you, Nicole, is, um, how would this amount of stormwater in local communities potentially change into the future? And how much can you project that from the modeling that you're doing? Yeah, yeah, thanks, great question. Um, yeah, first, just to remember, right, the, the generation and, and what we put in um, this research, the runoff generation is basically at that kind of 30 meter grid, right? So uh, two tenths of an acre, what's being generate, generated locally. Um, yeah, with climate change and increasing frequency and intensity of storms, uh, we actually just were published in that uh, journal of nature scientific reports by taking pre-processed um, or downscaled climate models and putting that uh, future precipitation projections into, into the tele results. I showed some of those from Billings. Um, Billings is an interesting example. Maybe they will have on an annual basis about 10% more rain or precipitation, rain or snow. Um, but that that is going to equate because of the timing and the distribution, you know, nearly 30% more runoff. So um, across the country, our aggregations are somewhere, you know, 10% more. But again, that's really localized and it'll depend upon um, how, how climate changes. Um, and it makes, you know, makes, a, makes us think about what Nathan was just talking about is how do we think about our design standards and the opportunities to not just put that water to better use, but you know, combat the increasing frequency of flooding that we're seeing in our in our local areas as well. So there's a real opportunity here to better manage stormwater and protect our communities uh, beyond just water security. Nicole, I thanks for that. Jump in and, oh, and please chime in, Nathan. Of, so and and, the, and and that's really exciting. The work that N Nicole has done on the Teller model is is just it lays such a fantastic um, baseline uh, for moving forward and moving forward. There's a lot of there's a there's another um, there's more work that needs to be done around the demand side. And so if we're thinking about demand side, there's a lot of different like I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways you can use stormwater. The most common one is irrigation, probably will be the largest potential in most geographies of, of the country. And and the demand side also shifts with climate change because we see longer droughts, and so we see longer periods. Even if our annual precipitation is increasing, it's more ha coming. Um, uh, more intensely and, and less frequently, but, but maybe a, a greater annual volume. But then, then we have these longer periods where we still need to, we need, we need to irrigate. So that's the challenge. Um, uh, it's also an opportunity to take that, that extra and um, if, we can, if we can store it and spread it out over those, those longer gaps. So that's, that, that's future, future study. And I think this report lays the groundwork for that. Thanks, Nathan. Another question that we've received from quite a few participants today has to do with public-private partnerships. And Shannon, this might be a good one for you, looking in terms of how to actually implement uh, these projects on the ground in local communities. What is the role of public-private partnerships in making these stormwater projects possible? Sure, I'll highlight a couple elements here and I'll go beyond public-private partnerships and say there's an opportunity for public-public partnerships as well. Um, really thinking about, um, actually I really liked how Nicole was phrasing this, the role for stormwater capture to go beyond water 
uh, security, but also to address multiple other challenges within a community. So when we think about public-private partnerships, we can think about, for example, um, incentives and opportunities for uh, housing developers, for example, to think about their water usage, the development of the land for retention to uh, supplement uh, existing potable water supply um, or decrease their reliance on potable water supply. And we can think about that win-win element where they're also increasing water quality, um, decreasing erosion, all those other elements in that place. At the end of this, I'm going to hand it to Nathan to talk about Towerside to give a kind of a living example of what that looks like. But prior to that, I want to talk about the what I briefly brought up were public-public partnerships and the role of, um, I would say, public entities and what they can be, for example, such as schools, um, and I'm going to reference LA County and the Safe Clean Water Program. And when we look at uh, stormwater capture and how it can contribute to things like urban greening and highly urban urbanized environments um, to minimize urban heat island effects and at the same time kind of benefit that local population. And this can be done in such a way that it's serving the greater community. It's also benefiting that local community and the community and the students that are served by that school and that entity. And then maybe Nathan, would you would you highlight Tower Side and that uh, public private private partnership on site? Sure, and and thank you, Shannon. And that and Tower Side is a, the image in the background um, there. So the, the Tower Side system was um, uh, a public private partnership uh, between a, a, a local watershed organization, which is a, it's a governmental entity um, with a specific jurisdiction. This one being in the city of Minneapolis, and they worked with four private developers and and came up with an, a legal agreement for the sharing of, of water across the eight acres of those four private developments that were going in and the um, and fully funded by the private developers, but facilitated, designed, and operated by the public entity to create uh, this opportunity for stormwater reuse, um, and to create an expansion of the public realm through additional park space that is also stormwater space, um, and all of the co-benefits that all the other panelists have been talking about, and it really set a model for um, for the Twin Cities region on how to how to create um, these public-private uh, partnerships, uh, dr driven primarily by 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 the public entity. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Shannon. Another question that we've received uh, from multiple participants has to do with. Uh, the changing pattern of rainfall across the United States and, and certainly globally, we're seeing a lot of communities uh, as a result of climate change, having a lot more rainfall more intensely uh, during storms. So the question has to do with um, the feasibility of capturing these flows when, it, when sometimes it just all seems to come at once. Uh, what's the feasibility of capturing this water uh, during large storms? Um, I can I can start an initial response and, and the others are be happy to build on it. Um, yeah, I, I think especially as we we as, as Nicole and others have, have discussed that, you know, as uh, climate change kind of creates more intense rainfall patterns um, with, with higher intensity and, and maybe more inter intermittency. Um, it's really going to it's really going to become necessary to use multiple approaches for, for stormwater capture to be able to maximize the amount of uh, of this resource to be captured. So that'll include some of these uh, cent more, uh, more centralized capture systems that might make use of existing storm sewers and divert that flow to uh, spreading grounds or, or, other, or uh, other storage facilities. But it also uh, uh, required the use of more distributed approaches like green infrastructure and um, household or site level rain barrels or, or stormwater uh, uh, cisterns that can help um, for, that, that can help just reduce the amount of, uh, of runoff entering the storm sewer in the first place. Um, in a lot of cities, especially along the East Coast, you know, these intense rainfall events um, are, are primary causes of, of combined sewer overflows um, where um, there, too much stormwater is generated uh, and it's not able to be conveyed uh, entirely to a treatment facility. And so therefore um, overflows into a natural waterway. But by reducing the amount of stormwater entering those systems in the first place um, through more distributed approaches, um, you, can, you can help to maybe offset some of those, some of those impacts of higher intensity. And, and you know, that's certainly something that's 
being seen even this year in Southern California with some of these torrential uh, rain, uh, rainfall events. Uh, a lot of it ends up being washed away into the ocean and not all of it is able to be captured, but thinking is with you know a, a wider diversity of stormwater capture methods and implemented, um, more of that rain, more of that precipitation could be captured across a variety of means. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy. I agree 100% with Brooke. It's all the tools in the toolbox um, and rain, right, coming out of the sky, thanks to all of our air quality regulations, a heck of a lot cleaner than it used to be. So closer to the source is better. And in the United States, in these state and local uh, MS4 permits, they all have post-construction requirements. So we're already seeing a large amount of investment by private developers and land managers to have to start thinking about stormwater management in a, in a different way. Um, and so, you know, challenging perceptions in the way that we capture and reuse it, whether it's putting it back into the ground, recycling it, um, you know, I mean, we flush our toilets with clean water, so we may have to start thinking about other other uses and other opportunities. Um, but it's gonna it's gonna take a widespread of solutions and really implement it at scale, I think, to to adapt to this changing climate that we're all facing. Thanks, Nicole and Brooke. Uh, maybe Heather will will come back to you as a panelist next for this question about water quality. There are several questions in the chat coming about. Uh, reuse of water that's been captured uh, through stormwater capture and some of the water quality or contamination concerns that might be out there. So open it up to the panel and maybe first over to you, Heather. Thank you, Amanda. And, and yes, please, panelists, uh, chime in. I think one of the benefits many look to stormwater capture is that, you know, as I indicated at the beginning, stormwater runoff can carry a number of pollutants into our waterways. Um, by slowing that water down, infiltrating it, um, the, the soil can start to filter that and reduce some of that pollution. Um, I, you know, I think there are, is a need for caution in terms of impacts on, on aquifers um, and management of the land uh, to ensure that we are sort of removing those pollutants. Um, but certainly we have the technology, we have the practices in place to be able to do that. Um, again, I would invite some others, Nicole or Nathan, if you have thoughts on sort of, sort of how you're seeing this, um, invite you to join in as well. Well, I'll go back to the Minnesota case study um, and the manager, the managed aquifer uh, uh, recharge uh, uh, potential. There's a lot of study going into it because protecting uh, our groundwater sources, uh, it, that's the reason, you know, augmenting them, protecting them is the reason for doing uh, MAR. Uh, so having a really robust study on on the pollutants that that, that, that travel, the, the time that it takes, um, the amount of cleaning that happens. I mean, a lot of projects, a lot of potential locations are ruled out for the purposes of protecting the quality of our groundwater supplies. That is of most critical um, importance. So on the groundwater side, I think there's a really there's a lot of a lot of modeling and a lot of um, you know regulation or at least um, you know a lot of a lot of guidance out there on the on the reuse side, uh, you know, for irrigation, you know, it's 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 you know fit for purpose. It's you design for the use that you're gonna you need. You know, if you're just irrigating your 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 your, your park at one in one in the morning, no one's out there. You, you, it's a different level of 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 treatment uh, than you know the the project that I have in the in the background here, where we're, we're also irrigating community gardens. So we have a, a more uh, comprehensive treatment system designed for that. And and a, and a more comprehensive monitoring uh, system as well to make sure that the water we're delivering um, it, it's not potable, but it is it is it's safe to use in in that environment. Um, so it, you know, I, water quality is I mean that's why we do these projects. It is the key driver. Um, so I you know that's a, those are good questions and absolutely those questions should be asked on every project down to a project down every design decision should get back to. Is this is this um, is this safe? Thanks, Heather and Nathan. I think we're down to maybe our last one or two questions here. We've had a number of questions come in about uh, the financial considerations here, the costs of uh, building some of these projects and engaging in more stormwater capture approaches. Uh, someone might uh, be willing to speak about the costs of of doing more stormwater capture and how the costs might be outweighed by by the ben benefits from a multi-benefit approach. 
I can kick it off and then would again invite others to, to join in. Um, we've done some work at looking at this in California using projects that were put in. Um, what we have found, and we've compared stormwater capture with other water supply options, including things like recycled water, desalin seawater desalination, um, and others. Uh, what we have typically found is stormwater capture projects are sort of in, in the middle. They're less expensive, I think, than some of the more, you know, seawater desalination, some of those other opportunities. Again, not every uh, community has access to seawater desalination, but for those that are, it tends to be less expensive. It's more expensive than some of the more sort of traditional projects, but we don't have a lot of those anymore. I think the point is we've exhausted those and now we have to look at these other alternatives. Uh, I, I will say as well, uh, the costs are highly variable from project to project. I think that's an important component. Um, and there are a number of co-benefits, Amanda, that you talked about that can help reduce that cost or at least uh, defray the cost, spread it out amongst different groups that can help to cover that. And that can help to make these uh, more pencil out better. Um, again, I'll, I'll invite either Nicole, Nathan, or anyone else if they want to chime in on the, on the cost topic. And just to say we have about one minute left, so please, on to other panelists here with this question. I'll just add a minor piece to what Heather said, but she talked about those co-benefits, and I would say you'll see more and more across projects the 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 emphasis or focus on identifying benefits and really doing, you know, one's best to monetize or value them and what they mean across the spectrum to the community in which these projects are located. What is the value of adding green space within a community? What is the value of increased biodiversity, decreased erosion, higher water quality to downstream users? Um, so really being more comprehensive in the valuing and the uh, cost estimates of projects and those benefits is also a core element of this. And then Nicole, I see you, you jumped off mute. Do you want to close? Oh, that? yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just, I think we pay in so many other ways, right? Water is so cheap. And so, but I mean, California, 20% of our energy is pumping water around. Um, so they, I think it's catching up with us a little bit, right? You can't go another day in the news without seeing more flooding of the local community, whether it's LA or, you know, the subways in, in New York City. So um, I think it's, like I said, catching up to us. And yeah, if we compare it to how much it costs uh, for, you know, available water, um, but I'm not sure those days are, are uh, going to continue. So I totally agree with everything you all said. We, we need a bigger picture, both on the costs and on the opportunities and, and benefits to our communities. Well, there's lots more to say. We're going to have to cut it off at this point. Uh, before we end, a few notes. We thank uh, very much our panelists and also a specific thanks to our colleague, Rob Jensen, for making today's webinar possible from a technical perspective. The slides and recording will be made available following today's webinar. Please do see the links in chat to download the full report, find media coverage, and learn more about the Pacific Institute's broader work on building water resilience in the face of climate change. If you have general questions, please don't hesitate to send them to us at info at pacinst.org. If you're a journalist and would like to connect with us to receive the data or schedule an interview, please don't hesitate to do so. Send us an email at media at pacinst.org. We also invite you to follow this and other work from the Pacific Institute on LinkedIn, where we share frequent updates. On behalf of the Pacific Institute and all of the panelists here today, thank you for being here with us today.